Ta-dun, dun, da-da. Ta-dun, dun, da-da. Okay. Welcome back. Oh, I, do, I do love Brad Fide. Is it Fidel or Fido? Sorry if I'm butchering his name. I do love his music. It is so good. Okay. Welcome back to the Awakening Film and TV podcast. Welcome back, Dustin, my brother. Today we are talking okay. about the Terminator movies, specifically focusing on Terminator 2, Judgment Day, but also the first one, Terminator, uh, because these are the ones that we grew up with as kids and um, that we really truly love. They have a special place in our hearts, at least in my heart. Dustin, did you wanna introduce yourself again and share anything about Terminator? Sure, thank you, Kristen. It's great to be back on your show. <laughs> I think a lot of people are gonna be familiar with Terminator um, as well. So anyway, uh, I'm uh, Dustin Mothersball, the older brother of this half here that you all are watching. And um, we both loved films growing up and acting. I think acting is more your thing than it is mine. I do very much enjoy it. Um, I like, I like, I like history. And so film history, it's a more recent history. So, um, so a lot of the, the standard canon greats are, are what I enjoy. It's beautiful, Dustin. Thank you. <laughs> and we're matching. You're today. welcome. We got such a brosis connection with our shirts. Brosis, yeah. Yes. Mine's ugly and less palatable, but it's more fluorescent. You're beautiful so, and bright. Anyway. Um, okay. Anyway. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> comfortable here for, for my beauty to be comfortable. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we probably saw the term, the first two Terminator films when we were too young. Yeah. Uh, I know there's like a nude scene in the first one. There's a lot of violence and gore in both of them. A lot of language issues, but um, despite all of that, uh, relative pizzazz to make it kind of exciting for a 90s, eight, late 80s and early 90s audience. I think there actually is something artful that James Cameron was trying to do there in a different way than like some of his later works. Um, the Abyss, I think, being the best. I'm really not a fan of almost anything after True Lies, which is more of a comedy with Schwarzenegger too. But uh, I, I think for me, like Titanic, uh, beautiful production value. We'll have to talk about that on here one day. So good. <laughs> I, I don't really like it beyond that. It should have been called Jack and Rose on the Titanic, who didn't exist, by the way. That's what the whole movie should have been called. Yeah, um, good. I like it. But, 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 but the, I, I mean, I find, it, I find it more watchable, honestly, in, in my opinion than avatar i find avatar absolutely I atrocious avatar. i hate avatar. it it's dances with wolves and pocahontas 2.0 and oh the bad military military so bad now the production value the um advancements in technology that cameron has pushed for his stylization and in his artistry i'm not going to argue with that that's the best uh, about as good as it's going to get um Cameron, I guess, I can't remember what he started out as. Was it a truck driver? And then he started developing the story of Terminator. And uh, he actually did sketches for the first Terminator back when, when it was much more modest budget, obviously, when you look at the first movie. And like his artwork, his illustration work is phenomenal, actually. And um, so like Cameron, I think I would be a director like him in that regard like very visual um and so like there is some something of that kind of illustrator magic that i think you see particularly in the second one but you do see some of it as much as they can do in the first one uh i think the exposition is really good i think the exposition by uh michael bean as as kyle reese is really really good I, I it's a shame he wasn't in the second one a little bit more yeah. i guess he didn't want to, he didn't want to have much to do with it i guess wow. he's in a deleted scene if you watch the extended version 
of Terminator 2 Judgment Day, but he's mostly just reserved for the first movie. It's it's he's in her head, so he's not really there uh in person in that story. So I think for me, the the best thing about the first one really is Kyle Reese. And then like the segue of how I think it works well from one to two is that evolution, that arc that we don't see in between both films with Linda Hamilton's character, um, where she's more of this novice and then she gets trained and she becomes efficient. You know, whereas, whereas like at the beginning, like there, there's not no efficiency. There's that boy that dumps that like ice cream <laughs> when she's a waitress into her her little uh, apron. And <laughs> and then the guy that she spilled coffee on or whatever it was said, nice going, kid. I should have given you the tip, you know, and there's that other line that always rings when she's talking to Reese. She's like, you're talking about things in the past tense that I haven't even done yet. Like, I can't even balance my checkbook. And so, like, just to see that, to see, to see, like, this positive story in some sense, I think she gets more cynical and scared, which isn't good, and she tries to overcome that by the end of the second movie. So there is another mini arc, which in some ways is more important yeah. in the second movie. But, like, to see her um, become more conscientious, more conscious, like, my life has a lot of meaning, and I thought it was just this little you know girl that it, it didn't matter and like her friend what does ginger say uh such a such a sensory such a sensory personality oh your boyfriend can't leave you hanging you know after they listen to the the voice or the uh the old um answering machine it's friday night for christ's sake and it's like oh my god there's bigger things than just partying on friday night but whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i didn't i don't want Gin, Gin, i didn't want ginger to die but not really a very unthinking unconscious early uh friendship you know kind of character not like her friends at the southern border in the second one where there's this like there's this economic and and political stress probably on those type of individuals <laughs> And just trying to make um, more of a difference, I guess. And and I mean, yes, there it is about survival, but there still is more of an awareness. It's not just like an animalistic survival. Um, so I appreciate that about those characters. The the villains you don't really get to know that much, but they do try to make the machine, the T eight hundred, the Arnold character in the second one, when he's reprogrammed from being bad to being good. They do try to make him more like he he's learning and adapting to working with John to more of a human experience. And like the, the last line is a great line. What What is it that she says? It's Sarah when she's narrating and it's just showing the road and it says something like if the if the T-800 can learn the value of human life, maybe we can, too. Oh, yeah. And so, like, there's a lot of the, there's a lot of, there is a lot of philosophical undertones in the movies. Um, and actually, I can't find the book. I was going to look for it. I was going to share it. I think because I'm cleaning out books. I'm not a fan of Jean-Paul Sartre, the continental philosopher. But he wrote something or he said something like, and I'm paraphrasing it here, like, man is nothing, uh, man is nothing but that which he makes of himself. And it's very similar to the fate line. The, um, what is it? The future is not set. There's no fate, but what we make for ourselves. So it sounds a lot like that. And he actually brings up machines. He calls them uh, articles of manufacture. In his book, um, what is it? Uh, Existentialism and, oh, I can't, I can't remember which book it was actually, now that I think about it. It might have been the is the new human humanism or something. It might have been that book. I think that because that's the one I've got. And so he talks about can machines actually um have freedom, you know, and and things like that. Um, or is it, you know, are like we we as humans have a god complex and can we grant something like freedom to something that's artificial? And of course, you look at like what like Kurzweil. <clears throat> has been writing for a while about the singularity that you know machines have consciousness 
um, or that, that at some point they're going to become self-aware. And that, that's how they, that's how these uh, transhumanists, which I don't agree with their philosophy, I don't think you can truly do it. And if you can, that's what this movie's here for. Like, this is a warning. Like, don't do that. That's exactly I mean, not that it's going to happen this way per se, but it's dangerous. Um, I don't think we can grant legitimate freedom like... Um, like you know the cyber dying systems and then i forget the 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 conglomerates that come afterwards in the story um i do think there might be well-meaning people like miles bennett dyson which um that's a great performance uh by i actually forget his name but it's his best performance um and so there, there is a lot basically in the story about free will um, I, I mean, I think it talks about, I, I mean, it obviously is saying if the future is not set, then there's no, obviously James Cameron and who, who was, it? was it William Wisher the second, I think helped co-write the second Terminator. Um, they obviously are coming from a philosophical presupposition that, uh, there's no fatalism, which I think there actually is some. I just don't know to what extent. So I'd say the answer is probably somewhere in the middle for me. But anyway, other than that, like the, I love the, I think most of the acting is really good. I mean, for Arnold, I think it's some of Arnold's best acting. Uh, but I mean, he's robotic anyways. So, and then um, Robert Patrick was great. Edward Furlong was really good. And I, I think that, um, there's some interesting character studies. I think the plot is pretty good. The second movie, I think, is the, should be the standard between practical and and visual effects. Almost, I think it, I think it actually fares just a little bit better, and it might be the nature of the effects uh, than Jurassic Park, the first one. But um, Industrial Light and Magic did a great job, and. So good. Uh, Stan, it was Stan Winston as well who did the practical. So, I uh, I think for me, what really I mean, the action sequences are fantastic. But for me, those movies, that's why I don't like the second one. It's very much about the style and the tone, and like that fine line between like it. And it, it's I think it is the epitome of where fantasy meets science fiction. Yeah, especially with, especially with the T one thousand. So anyway, I'm I'm just gonna sum that up there. But those are just some of my general thoughts. Yeah. Ooh, you brought up some really good ones that uh, we'll delve into. And I didn't mean to jump so much on the philosophical stuff yet, but I just yeah. got excited because it is very it, there is a philosophical tone to it. Yeah, which um, is what I think we love about it. Because as you can see, my brother has um, many many philosophy books. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of these are religious books here. I am weeding out a lot of the, the philosophy ones, but uh, I, I like more traditional philosophy anyways. That is more compatible with religious uh, theosophy. So yes, anyway, but yes. Uh, so what about you? Like, let's, well, what, what, what are your takeaways from Terminator movies? I, I, and I know we're kind of excluding all the other sequels. We're just looking at one and well, two. I wanted but. to focus on the second one, Judgment Day, but I know sometimes it's kind of lumped in with the first one, which is why we can talk mm -hmm. about that too. But the second one is the one that like is like burned in my psyche from childhood in a good way because we watched it so much, like so much more than the first one. And it's like it just deeply embedded in me. <laughs> So that's the one I wanted to focus on, but we could talk about the other one some other time if you want. And just before I get into like my, my little takeaways, um, Dustin mentioned, you mentioned basically like a lot of the people that were working on this, but it was a, a 1991 film. Uh, it was actually released on my birthday in oh, 91, July 3rd, and Miranda, my wife, was born in 91, so I just find that funny. Oh, that is funny. Like, uh, and the first one was made, or came out in 84, so uh, it was a few years after, and um, yeah, Dustin already mentioned, directed by James Cameron, who co-wrote the script with William Wisher, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, Robert Patrick, and Edward Furlong, and I think that Robert Patrick 
it did such a good job the liquid metal man it's one of his absolute best performances one of the few things that actually has scared me in my entire life <laughs> was the the cgi and his mm -hmm. acting so phenomenal um so anyway mm. uh it brings up those are that's just like a, a little bit about it but it actually did pretty darn well it made uh quite a bit of money uh and it has a huge cult following as most people know um anyway the themes that i liked about it were uh, the time travel I, I like time travel um and i like that it does kind of go between this pessimism about humanity like uh humanities are just going to destroy themselves that's even one of the lines in uh terminator 2 it's in your it's in, it's in your nature it's in your nature yeah to destroy yourself yeah but then at the same time we see this human compassion even from a machine which brings up this beautiful question of like could machines learn compassion and then um yeah i i thought like the soundtrack was great as i started this podcast the direct <laughs> you know i've never owned that soundtrack that's one of the few films we loved growing up with that i was actually thinking about i don't have any money right now any spare change but it might be one i'll get it actually and all i actually want like a physical copy of of maybe the first two movies and i could get you those copies at some point but but yeah i mean and i think there's an evolution oh yeah to the music oh, and yeah. it's just, it's the same composer it's the it's uh fidel he does both the first and second movie oh that's beautiful yeah it works mm -hmm. really nicely yeah really good composer um yeah the action sequences i agree it's all so good um and i love the a lot of kind of fantasy and sci-fi stories go this way but it, there's like this idea that one person can change the fate of the world you know hmm. like it's on one person's uh like responsibility but of course they have other people helping them along the way to ensure that they are the one which john connor is like the one uh right. and then i love like you were just saying it's like a little bit of a warning for humanity to not let ai kind of like cyberdyne uh overpower us destroy us um the whole transhumanism like elon musk says is inevitable and makes you wonder like mm. ah well do we have to just be victims to it like aren't we the creators of this ai don't they take our image and how can we right. maybe create them with this sense of compassion so it doesn't turn out that way i don't know just good ethical questions about technology and humanity anyway those were the few things i wanted to share <laughs> no the, the, that's a really good point are there fail safes that can be put into place or uh, i'm sure that actually a lot of i wonder i i bet the singularity has already been surpassed and we just don't know about it yet i know i mean cloning had been going on before we we always find out about it after the fact really of course uh, i just hope that they're not um misusing it but i have my uh i have my doubts um the military industrial complex which would be like a cyber nine we know that it's it's too big it's too great it was already an issue you know in the 50s when eisenhower gave that farewell address so uh i don't know <laughs> i don't know what the common person can do about it but um i think that I think that's why I disagree with the that overall premise of like absolute autonomy, absolute free will. I think there is a spiritual force guiding us and protecting us by and large. And um, I think we're seeing that now. So I don't think that it's going to come to that. We're like, obviously, like that kind of cap, those many casualties, you know, Michael Bean, what did he explain? It was. Um, it was defense. It was defense mainframe of computers that basically became self-aware 
uh, supposedly in 97. Actually, there's some interesting things about the date, too. I looked up the date. So the the date mentioned in the second movie, I can't remember if it's mentioned in one, but it's August 27th, 1997. Or maybe, or is it August 29th? It was either, I can't read my writing. It's either the 29th or the 27th of August. So there's been some interesting things throughout history that have happened. So in 70 CE, Jerusalem actually fell to Rome. And then um, the Seven Years' War, it also was going on. Um, It began in 1736. So that was like when the, uh, what was it? The Austrian in the Habsburgs were battling uh, Frederick II from Prussia because they were wanting to regain, um, was it, I forget, was it Siberia, I think? I could be wrong on that. But anyway, uh, Hurricane Katrina was in 2005, so that was after the fact of the movie. But the, the most interesting date is just like we had the Trinity test, the atomic bomb tests here, in the United States before we went to take our uh, atomic capabilities to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Uh, the Soviet Union actually, um, on August 29th, 1949, uh, dropped the Joe one atomic bomb for testing in Russia. And then that's when it's like, you know, you had the, the US and the USSR kind of like nuclear mutually assured destruction if anyone tried to it's kind of what like dr strange love was about so we knew we knew that the soviets had the those nuclear capabilities and so it was kind of like terminator in some sense is kind of a continuance of that tradition that cold war tradition um when does it stop being a cold war and will we off all of ourselves in which case you know, it's like years after the rubble that Kyle Reese said he was born and he was raised to kind of, it was survival. And like, he talks about the early Terminators would pinpoint people that were marked for termination, as he put it. Um, and they were easier to spot because like the, the 600 models, I think it was, had like rubber faces and stuff, but then they became cyborg, cybernetic organisms, where it's like the actual fusion it's a frankenstein it's a fusion where the organic matter is on the surface right uh so it's it's it i mean Ar- arnold is terrifying in that movie and like the like when that janitor is cleaning up and he's already been shot up and he's cut into his you know arm and he's cut into the eye that got shot up and they're like was that a dead cat in there buddy you know it's like the smell like the the part of him was rotting up but like being said he will not stop he doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear and he's not going to stop until you're dead yeah. and so like it's just this unrelenting it's almost and you could almost take it like michael myers actually yeah. in halloween which is just referred to as the shape and carpenter's script for halloween it's fate remember there's uh whenever Lori's in the classroom Lori Stroh the Jamie Lee Curtis character is in the classroom they're talking about oh who 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 is it that they're referring to I can't remember the writer but like fate is immovable like a mountain it never changes it's not it's unstoppable and like you know it's almost like the T800 or even the T1000 they're like that it's like this massive It's like they keep fighting it off and they can slow it down, but it keeps coming back. And ultimately both all the, all of the Terminator movies, even the later ones, they're all about, yes, they eventually can stop these, these Terminators that, that fate isn't written down and they can knock the adversaries out. So it has much more of a, I guess, a positive view on a completely open volition or free will. Yeah, I agree. Kind of approach. I agree with you that it's always a combination of uh, possible fates. And you're oh, you, what? Why do you think that for you? Oh, um, well, because of my my psychic work. Honestly, I can uh, once mm. I started really seeing things for clients and for myself and understanding. Oh, this is how it works. It was shown to me in that uh, we all have different multiple timelines in each moment. 
and our free will determines which one we choose. But you could say it's not full free will because only our higher self, our part of um, God's source creator, the universe, whatever you want to call it, that part that has overseen and helped uh, plan our lives, they have the full free will. Okay. I hope you don't mind I'm eating. <laughs> I'm sure that. that. Agree with me, by the way. But what I'm trying to say is the higher self has the full free will and the human perspective has free a free will number of options, but it's not uh, as much as, uh, you know, we, we can't do anything we ever could want as a human. We, can, we only have a certain number of options to choose from. But anyway, so right. a combination between fate and free will and um, I agree. I like that about it, too. It's like these are the ultimate assassins. They're freaking scary. But there's always a way that humanity can still prevail and survive. So there is a hopeful message under all of this. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about a couple things. Um, sure. And how like you were saying, it's a, it's after the cold war. Thank you for showing that perspective because, uh, I think a lot around that time and even still is dystopian, like doomsday stuff. It gets, it's really popular yeah. and that yeah. people are scared of Armageddon and, uh, yeah. that scene in Terminator two of Sarah Connor's vision, right. Of, the children on the playground being burned alive. Do you remember that? That is so yeah. visceral. And, yeah. And it is, I believe, an actual option of humanity, but I am an optimist and I believe we are not taking that path. So uh, you kind of hinted about that. What, what do you think? Well, I think if it even came to that, like, let's say, let's say the uranium one that was being stockpiled by members of our government in North Korea and Iraq and Iran were successful in creating proxy wars between the United States and Russia, which I, I really think that this stuff is going to come out, um, that the 44th president and his secretary of state were planning this. Um, I don't know how successful it would have been. I mean, if it, if it was brought to the absolute brink where something happened, I really do think something is set in stone for humanity to not take that route. Um, I mean, I'm not playing God here. I'm just speculating because of how things have happened i'm like well maybe it never was a real option like maybe this whether whether you want to call it the prime mover the godhead god yahweh allah whatever you want to call it um maybe uh uh it just wasn't uh, in the cards because there's something else that needs to happen and i know that i've um when i was studying revelations in particular there's been some speculation on the translations does it say the end of time or the end of a time right like the end time. is it the end of times yeah. plural like all times or is it uh just a particular time we don't know um and you almost have to study revelations with some sort of particular theory in mind to make sense of it it's so complicated um i mean if you think there's any validity to it at all so um but anyway going back to it i i think that the ultimate message is optimistic that we can come we can overcome whatever kind of hell that is brought on us by something out of our control or by ourselves even um and that it can be fixed the Miles Bennett Dyson character is a really tragic figure. You know, he was, he had, and it, it's, he's kind of a character where like his personal 
actions show redemption at the end, but like it shows that good intentions don't really mean anything. Like he still is, he wasn't really recreating anything. Like what Linda Hamilton, when they have that little there, you know, I mean, he's mostly just being quiet and letting sitting back and letting her, her go on and John interrupt saying you're not being constructive here. Um, but um, there is some truth in her criticism. No, I mean, I ultimately, I think I agree with you to an extent, or at least on certain things, that um, ultimately there is going to be an optimistic ending. And I think there's been way too many times we probably could have completely off the entire planet, and it's always been saved at the brink. There's something looking out, whether it's because of little green men <laughs> or, or some clockmaker that created the little green men that's watching whatever or just a clockmaker i i don't know like i mean we don't know but there does seem to be something that's protecting us and i think it's not to keep using us i think it's probably i i would say it's the ultimate creator that there's there's got to be like like it's out of the goodness for its own sake to keep us alive um uh i mean i'm not against free market i will admit that like I, I don't like any of the isms the pluralisms of economic theory because they're controlled by the powers that be so it i'm thinking more of a like a laissez-faire system not this keynesian kind of economy that we live in now where in times of stress you know they pump more market uh, more money into the market rather and and so on like like this system is not sustainable and and the people that created it are the ones that that make off with all of the money from it and they take it from us um i think ultimately like the, the movies the, the the movies have a little bit of everything the first one focuses more of course on the romantic element yeah. but uh, i mean you get a lot of action you get a lot of tragedy you get uh some comedy um and a lot of horror as well as science fiction and fantasy so it, it has a little bit of everything yeah um, for everyone and i don't think any of the sequels have come close in quality really of the first two but particularly the second like they just keep the stories go oh well you changed you know the future but you didn't stop the future of this you know man versus machine war basically so i mean that that's you can tell they're making them just to make a buck like i don't think they're really great works of art uh the first two might be they're, they're pretty close i think so yeah so i really like them i think they're very special they're they're different than other action or science fiction movies they don't um they don't follow the same rules I mean, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's weird. It's like, yeah, it's like Blade Runner meets Full Metal Jacket meets Halloween. It's, and then like meets, I don't know, Alien or Legend or something. It's very strange, like mixture of you know, like things, but how it's fused together in a, in a really unique way. I think I, it's still my favorite work of Cameron's. Um, I wouldn't really call myself a Cameron fan, even though I, would watch his movies i think he's very intelligent there is a nostalgia to it i'm um, growing up with with these movies so yeah and i think that they are made with heart and a love More of so certain... other movies that are made now you think yeah i think there are a lot of movies like you said of the following sequels that seem to be more like just trying to make a buck. But I think right yeah. now we're in a beautiful time where there's a lot being made and put out there. So actually there are plenty of things made with heart too that are getting their time in the sun. Yeah, so Terminator is something like special because it is original with a combination of so many different things. And it does have this message of, I think hope for humanity which I really like at its core, which I think is its heart. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm.
I, I would agree. So this was fun. This was fun. We'll be back. <laughs> I had to. Hasta la you want to live. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um yeah thank but you ter terrible arnold schwarzenegger impersonation <laughs> it was great all right till next time it was actually michael bean that said that line first come okay. with me if you want to live yeah oh that's right that's so yeah funny. arnold stole it he appropriated it in the second one and now this everyone says it with an austrian accent yep come with me if you want to live See, that was good. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> he does great in it. Um, I think I think it's just all really good. Production is just wonderful. Thank you for uh, chatting. It's always so good to hear all of your awesome information that you provide and your opinions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for inviting me back. Yeah. And thanks for whoever's listening or watching this. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Hit like, please. <laughs> yeah. Subscribe. <laughs> Subscribe, please. <laughs> thank you. There, I'm trying to help you out. Trying to help thank, you out. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, uh, everyone. Thank you. Bye.